All right, here we go. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I was actually going to open with a joke on not sure if I was uh, being honored with being the first speaker or just the guy who's uh, supposed to be full of the time until everybody shows up, but um, I guess it's not really going to work today. Um, my name is Jens Axpo. I am a software engineer at Facebook. I work on the Linux kernel, I've written a bunch of things related to the IO stack, IO schedulers, and so forth. And today I will be talking to you about what's new in the world of storage for Linux. This is actually a sort of a follow-up presentation to one I did at this venue two years ago when I talked about Block Multi IQ, which is the new scalable IO infrastructure for, uh, for Linux. And uh, this talk will talk about some of the things that have happened since BlockMQ, some of the changes we've made, some of the new features, and so on. So first of all, just a, a quick update on BlockMQ. Um, when it was introduced, it was added as a, like a parallel or third IO stack for Linux, and the idea was that we'd convert all the old drivers over to the new stack, and then at some point, uh, we'd be able to kill off some of the old dead code. Um, so I'm happy to say conversions have been going pretty well. Converted some of the old uh, flash drivers like STEC, um, NBD, the network uh, block device, Actually using BlockMQ in an interesting way, in um, usually drivers use it for scalability reasons. Um, NBD uses it to tie multiple sockets to the same connection to improve the, the bandwidth of the application. And MMC is, is almost done. Um, Scuzium Q was, so sorry, fly. Um, Scuzium Q is the uh, queuing infrastructure for Scuzzy that sits on top of BlockMQ. And uh, that's been available in the kernel for quite some time. It's been default off and people were able to uh, toggle the switch and turn it on. Um, we flipped the switch for, uh, for by default recently. Um, had to flip it back due to some performance concerns we saw, not on scalability, but more on cases for rotating storage where um, the need to build up really big requests or uh, paramount to get into full performance of them. So we're going through those issues and um, should, be, should be back on default pretty soon, I hope. Uh, one of the old compact KISS drivers was moved to SCSI, so that's another one we don't have to convert. And uh, in total, basically now we have about 15 drivers left to convert. As the old saying goes, it ain't over till the fat lady sings. And in this case, it's not over until floppy that sees converted. I think two years ago, I put a prize on, on, on that conversion, and none of you took it all up, so I'm a little disappointed. Uh, the prize is still standing, so contact me if you're interested. Um, one of the main new features we've added has been IO scheduling. Uh, this was sort of the main missing feature of the new framework. Um, it's easy to tell people to convert drivers over to the new framework, but if we don't have the scheduling that most users require uh, available, then it's not really going to work. So a lot of time was spent coming up with a framework to support IO scheduling within BlockMQ. There's a couple of design uh, and architecture decisions in BlockMQ that made this really difficult. One is that if you look at the old stack, uh, you basically have a big pool of schedulable requests and at some point when you hand it to the driver, you assign a tag to it and then the driver can submit it to the hardware. On BlockMQ, everything is centered around the, the tag for the device. So right from the get-go, when we get the I.O. And, and funnel it through the kernel stack, we already have a tag assigned. This means that we have a one-to-one -one mapping between the kernel request and the device driver request, and that um, becomes a big problem for scheduling. You can't really schedule anything if your domain is the same as what you hand over to the device. You need a bigger pool of things to schedule. So we had to come up with a concept of, of having shadow tags and, and different sets so we could uh, support this feasibly. Another one was flush handling. Uh, flush requests or uh, IO requests to tell the device to flush its uh, write back cache. And these have been, um, the design of that wasn't that great in the kernel. That hasn't been a big issue. But then when you do something like scheduling, it all of a sudden becomes a, a, big, a big hurdle. And uh, lastly, uh, scalability. I mean, it doesn't matter if we have a nice scalable IQ stack. If once you add scheduling, which people need to use, that it doesn't scale anymore. So we spent a lot of time in that, and as a result, in 4.11, we added this uh, framework uh, to support scheduling within multi-Q, and initially came with uh, what we call a non-scheduler, which is basically just the old behavior of, of what I call roughly FIFO, and MQ deadline, which is a conversion of the old deadline scheduler within MQ. Still a single queue design, um, but it works within the new framework. And later on for 4.12, we added BFQ and Kyber, BFQ being um, a scheduler that's been around for years and years on the legacy side of things, hasn't been integrated into the kernel, but it's basically a revamp and improved design of, of CFQ, so something that provides uh, fair bandwidth and good latency and interact in interactiveness for desktop users. And finally, Kyber, which is a fully multi-Q uh, wear design, uh, mostly used on NVMe for now. It supports uh, basic things like uh, reader, reader versus writer fairness and, and so forth. <clears throat> 
One of the other new features we added was something called write back throttling. So to understand what that is, you first need to understand what, how the kernel handles write back. Basically, when an application <clears throat> uh, writes uh, to files on a file system, at some point, that dirty data needs to be flushed to the back end store to be uh, safely stored. And that can either happen explicitly through the application doing something like fsync or sync file range, something like that. If the application does not, uh, at some point the kernel will decide that now we need to clean these pages. We can't leave them around forever. Um, and that's called background write back. And uh, when the kernel decides that is the case, either because the data is too old or we have too much, basically ends up looking something like this. Uh, if you can imagine the 30 pages being the donuts and the back end store being Homer Simpson, uh, the kernel keeps on shoving huge and huge bunches of these down uh, the kernel's neck. And uh, that quickly becomes a problem. So as the term implies, background I.O. is supposed to be background I.O. So it's something that's supposed to be happening in the background and you as the user, either that being on your laptop or a server running an important application, you're not supposed to notice this. But when you cram this much um, I.O. at one point, at the same point in time down to the device driver, that becomes an issue. Um, one of the issues with that is that if, if you look at device performance, you generally want a certain number of requests to give to the device to get the performance where you want it. At some point, uh, adding more requests doesn't do anything for your performance, it just decreases uh, or increases your latency. So um, right back throttling is a way to try and attempt to keep this balance so we get the performance that we want, but don't give the device too much and incur big latency penalties. Uh, you can compare this to, uh, it was inspired by the right back throttling by CODEL, the network scheduling algorithm, which uh, monitors a bunch of uh, packages, their completion time or transmission time over a window of time and if the minimum latency observed exceeds a certain value, then it starts dropping packets. So this is interesting for I.O. scheduling. Um, this is a note from uh, April 1st of this year. Omar um, announced a new MQ scheduler. And uh, if you want to read through this, <clears throat> there's a little bit of a nugget in there that sort of highlights the main difference between networking and scheduling. Basically, what Omar is saying is that um, since we don't have any notion of marking packets with ECN or congestion on the disk side, we can simply just drop the writes, and that provides great performance. Um, it turns out that that doesn't really work very well for, for disk writes, uh, whereas on the networking side, you can rely on retransmits. Um, if you drop writes on the floor, users generally get pretty unhappy. So we had to come up with a different concept to sort of handle this, uh, this balance. Um, so we, we apply the same techniques as monitoring the minimum latencies in a window of time. Um, we monitor the latencies of both the reads and the writes. And if they exceed a certain limit, then we just throttle down the queue depth of the background writes. So basically, we have a slider saying, you know, you can queue you know, 16 writes at the time. If we start to see de uh, increases in latencies, we just scale that down. If we don't have any reads ongoing, we can scale them up the other way. So we basically snap between um, a stable baseline. This was added in 4.10, and uh, we've seen some pretty good results out of it. My initial, the initial, uh, uh, the reason why I came up with it was that I got uh, complaints from people at Facebook that are running services on servers and saying, you know, sometimes when people update images or whatnot on these servers, we see just horrible service latencies. So uh, to come, to sort of mimic that behavior and have something that people could test, uh, I came up with something called the Write Back Challenge, which is basically two different uh, RPMs that you can install in the system. Small files, which installs a bunch of, of small files, and big files, which installs few, just very large files. And the idea is you run the service that, you, you, uh, that you're running on this server and monitor the performance of it while you install these RPMs. This is a classic case of background write back, right? So you install this RPM that installs maybe a gigabyte worth of files, and it completes pretty quickly. And then at some point, you see this burst of write coming out. Um, so the test case here was running an app called IOGO. IOGO basically keeps doing read requests uh, and observes the latency of them, and it notes violations. And violations are requests that take longer than, than you wanted it to. So two uh, quick test cases, one on NVMe and one on a hard drive. And, uh, and we can see there, there's some pretty drastic uh, differences in, in performance. Uh, the NVMe one is, is a little nicer. The hard drive, you look at that, without right back throttling, for the IO Go app, we observed read latencies of up to 6.5 seconds, which is forever in IO terms. And even the average of 1.6 seconds is horrible. And with it on, we keep a pretty nice latencies average, 200 milliseconds or half a second at most. On words hitting storage, that's not too bad. Another feature we added 
By the way, you have to excuse me. I'm going through these pretty quick. I think most of these features are worthy of a, a full talk, but I'm just going to speed through them. If you have questions, you know, raise your hand, or you can do questions at the end. Either way is fine. So another thing we added was I/O polling. I/O polling is is a different way of doing I/O completions. Um, most most devices, well, when you hand in some piece of work, right, you, the application goes away, does something else, and then the device at some point raises an interrupt, says, "Oh, work's now done," and the application wakes up or go and goes and tends to it. Um, for new devices now that we have that are not flash-based but non-volatile memory, um, the completion times are so quick that the act of going to sleep and getting the interrupt and waking up is a substantial part of the actual completion time. Obviously, that's not the case in a hard drive where a request takes maybe 10 milliseconds, but if you I/O device can do I/O in say two to three microseconds, um, then it becomes noticeable. This is what a uh, usual um, completion event looks like. Um, all the way from down from the system call, going through the I.O. stack to the device driver, marking up, and then we have this big spot in the middle that says wait, where the uh, application that does I.O. goes to sleep, and then finally woken up by the I.O.Q. handler. So for polling, uh, it looks something like this instead. So basically the only thing that's changed is that instead of going to sleep, the application will just sit in a very tight loop and go ask the device driver, is my work done, is my work done, is my work done, until it finally says yes, you know, go away, it's done and the application can, can continue on its way. So this means that we can get faster completion times. Let's say that we're spending a couple microseconds going to sleep and waking up, and now with polling, we're completely eliminating that. So we get a latency a decrease, which is really nice. The downside is, of course, that um, uh, as for power consumption, it's not a very nice behavior. Obviously, it's, it's better to put the CPU into a deeper uh, sleep state uh, while this is happening. So it's sort of, uh, sorry? So actually for the polling, it, uh, the question is how about preemption, we check for preemption. So we abort the polling loop if preemption is required. So it's, it's a, it's a, it's a trade-off. So the question is if there's a better solution than this. Can we do something smarter than just sit in a very tight loop and ask the device if it's done? So what we came up with um, is something called hybrid polling. So if we compare the, uh, the two approaches, the one at the top, classic polling, basically sitting in a tight loop asking for completion, and the bottom one called hybrid polling where um, once we submit the I.O. to the device, we go to sleep for a period of time, and then we wake up before the interrupt comes in. So that seems like magic. I mean, how do, how do we time that, right? So the good thing about these uh, devices that are really fast is they're generally very deterministic as well. So we added some code in the kernel to, um, in a scalable fashion, track the I.O. completion times of I.O. requests uh, depending on I.O. size. So let's say the application is doing 4K I.O. and we keep tracking, tracking this. Am I still on? Um, um, if we know that it takes, say, four milliseconds, or four microseconds, sorry, to complete this request, um, we can go to sleep for a certain part of that four microseconds as long as we wake up in time to actually take the interrupt. So the idea here being that ideally what you'd do, you'd go to sleep and you'd wake up and be ready to run at the very instant the IRQ comes in. So the question is, what is, a good, what is a good time to sleep? I mean, if you look at statistics, if you go to the bus stop and the bus comes every uh, 20 minutes, right, statistically you'll be waiting on average 10 minutes for the bus. So the, the uh, initial approach here was, let's just track the completion times and we'll sleep for half of that. A smarter approach might have been to look at, you know, how, how much time does it actually take to go to sleep and wake up and factor that in. Uh, but it turns out that this very simple approach of just using half of mean uh, works really well. Probably because there's a high correlation between um, the completion time of the I.O. device and um, the speed of the processors and, and uh, ex ex exit latencies for the sleep states these days. Um, I'll show some results on that on, on the next slide. Um, so basically how to use polling. Uh, we've had a couple of different approaches until it arrived in the kernel. Um, for now, you can use the new p write v2 and p read v2 system calls that has a flags argument. Uh, if you set the high pri flag for that and you're doing no direct I/O, you will get polling. There are two sysfs files associated with on with this on the device side that controls uh, how polling works. One is I/O underscore poll, basically just enables or disables poll. The other one's called I/O poll delay. And that's by default set to minus one, which means we're going to do classic polling, just spin for the whole time. If you set it to zero, the kernel will use the hybrid polling. And if you set it to a positive number, you can actually force a specific delay latency. Say if you write three to it, um, the kernel will sleep for three, sec or three microseconds um, instead of doing these calculations. <clears throat> 
So here's some quick results on what this looks like for a fast device. I don't know if you can see the colors down there, but if you look all the way to the right, the tall blue one is the REQ. So that's the classic approach. Uh, we see latencies around six microseconds for that, doing 512 byte random reads on this device. And then there's, if you look to the left, there's a, sort of a cluster of, of graphs that are basically sitting on top of each other, about 4.5 microseconds. And that's the adaptive uh, hybrid polling, so the one that does the automatic sleep delays and the classic polling. So we basically get identical results out of that. And then there's a couple in between that set a, set a manual poll latency. But the good news is that we get the same uh, performance out of the adaptive hybrid polling at vastly less CPU time. Obviously, classic polling will use 100% of the CPU. With the hybrid polling, we can get that down to somewhere in 40 to 50% range. That may still seem high, but if you compare that to the IRQ approach at these sort of rates, we're actually pretty close. It's still using more, but efficiency-wise, if you compare IOPS or latency to the CPU time, uh, we're better off with the adaptive polling. So, faster ODirect is not a new feature, it's just an improvement of the existing ODirect infrastructure that you have in a kernel. Um, given that we can now do IOs in the three, four, five microsecond range, any extra latency on the kernel side becomes a big problem. And that is an issue when you have people on the both networking and storage side saying, oh, let's use you know, DPDK or SPDK or any of the other user land infrastructure for managing these devices since we can completely avoid the kernel overhead. As kernel people, obviously, we want to not be out of a job, so it's, we want to ensure that people uh, still want to use the kernel, plus there are some you know, benefits to it and, and how you manage devices and all these things. Um, so faster ODirect was just an approach to saying, all right, let's see if we can make ODirect any faster at all. Um, it turns out that we could. Um, we split into basically two paths. One is you know, for large requests, which uh, by nature aren't uh, as latency sensitive as small ones. Uh, that follows just by the very reason that if you're doing a one megabyte request, the DMA time is you know, substantial over the bus. Uh, if you're doing 512 bytes and you're only down to you know, 4.5 microseconds for an I.O. request, um, then you care a lot more about the latency. So we split it into two and eliminated a bunch of, of allocations in the kernel and, and, and uh, some of the sillier things that we do, and we're able to get some pretty good performance out of that. Um, this applies both on the, if you're doing ODirect to a raw block device or if you're doing it through the file system. Christoph added some new infrastructure called FSIO map that um, XFS I think is the only use of so far. But through that you can have pretty efficient ODirect as well. And the result was that we shaved six to seven percent off of the IO time uh, for ODirect. This is obviously for the uh, IRQ case, but 6.4 to six microseconds it was pretty good. And uh, all this stuff was merged before 10. Another case, um, well once, I think I mentioned in the talk two years ago, that once you start making things scalable, um, it always seems like you're never finishing up, right? When you look at CPU profiling, you probably know this from doing applications or other kernel stuff, uh, you'll typically see glaring hotspot at the top and you'll go fix that and then you'll run performance benchmarks and the performance is the same and you're like, you know, what, what happened here? Then you do profiling again, it's just something new sitting on top. Um, only when you've solved, you know, all your problems will you get the better performance. Um, IO accounting used to be one of those things that uh, when you looked at kernel profiles, it didn't even show up because the old stack wasn't scalable at all. So these are the parts of the kernel that does the tracking required for you to be able to run IO stat and other things and use the land and get some notion of you know, completion times and Q depths and whatnot on your device. So they're, they're on by default and uh, lots of sysadmins lie on them to, to get a good idea of what's going on on the IO side. So after we got multi-Q that scaled, um, looking at the IO stat tracking was one to two percent of the total CPU time, which is substantial for something that's just you know, basically helping you see the completion latency of your release requests. It's not an integral part of how IO works in the kernel, it's just um, tracking metrics on the side. Uh, if you do some synthetic testing on this, um, there's a switch in the kernel you can enable and disable the tracking per device. Um, we could see that we uh, went from 2 million to 20 million IOPS on purely synthetic testing if you just disable IO stats. So it was clear there was, there was a problem. And the main issue there was essentially just that we have per device a shared in-flight counter that we increment and decrement for each I.O. And bouncing around that cache line in the system is enough to uh, severely hurt your scalability. So the good news is we're blocking queue since we already had the tagging infrastructure that's very scalable and, and works well on multi-queue systems. We could utilize that um, to uh, keep track of how many I.O.s we have in flight. Since we already do this uh, allocation and freeing up the tag for each I.O., um, we didn't have to do anything extra. 
the only extra thing we had to, to do was when you wanted to sum up the I.O. request you have in flight, you have to count how many busy bits you have in the system. Uh, so that means you're, you're shifting um, your performance profile a little bit. Um, but doing that uh, allowed us to uh, completely scale the RF stats tracking and keep it enabled for the fast devices. And uh, this code was, was recently merged, so it'll be in uh, 414 kernel. Not a user visible change, but something that's pretty nice uh, for fast devices. Another new feature we added, and uh, Michael will enjoy this one since he had to battle the man page update, is called write lifetime hints. Um, when an application writes data, uh, the kernel has no idea what this data is. So the kernel doesn't know if this is uh, uh, data that will live for a very long time or it's going to live for a very short time. Usually that's not a problem. If you're on a hard drive, you just write things out. Nobody really cares if you intermingle these things. If you're on flash devices, it's, it's a problem. Flash devices generally divide writes into what they call erase blocks, which are, are huge, could be multiple gigabytes on devices these days. Um, if you go and later invalidate these writes, at some point that erase block has to be copied to a new one internally, and, um, and in that case you're interested in having as much of that data either be valid or invalid. So for flash devices we call this write amplification. If the user writes one gigabyte of data to the device, ideally you want the device to be writing a gigabyte as well. If the write is, uh, is writing two gigabytes instead, you have a 2x write amplification and that reduces your performance and your lifetime of the device and so forth. So for flash devices, they're really interested in bundling these writes together so that if you go and invalidate them, you're invalidating most of the things that are, um, have shared uh, locality on the device. So we added some infrastructure in the kernel to support this. Um, uh, get and set read write hints can be set on both inodes and files. And we added support for four different categories of these, short, medium, long, and extreme. There's no, these are relative terms, right? So what means short for one application might not mean short for another one. As long as the application uses these in a fashion that makes sense for it, then we should be in, in pretty good shape. Um, NVMe added support for this in 1.3, so the kernel support this for NVMe. And uh, the kernel, I think we added support in 4.13 or 4.12. I forgot to put that on the slide, uh, but it's pretty recent. Some of the internal testing we did at Facebook uh, showed that for RoxyB or MyRox, we can see as much as 25 to 30% reduction in physical writes on the NAND device, which is huge. Um, gives really good uh, latency boosts, um, as well as uh, increases the longevity of the device. Mm -hmm. Yes. I can just repeat the question. So the question is if the hints when you set it on inode is persistent. And the answer is that is not the case. Um, the uh, file system could choose to make it so, but that's not currently the case. Um, it's not as much of a problem as you might assume. Since you're writing, the, when you're writing this data again to the device, the device should already know what stream this belongs to and we should be okay. But it would be nice to make it persistent. The reason why we do have different hints, by the way, for inodes and files is because of buffered I.O. When you do, as mentioned, the kernel will do async write back at some point, so we need to tie to the I.O., we can't tie to the file. So basically when you do a write for a, uh, a file, it'll check if there's a hint set for this file. If that's not the case, it'll look for the inode um, and see if there's a hint set, and if that's the case, we'll use that. So that's why we have to do two different sets. I.O. throttling is another thing that we improved. Um, the original support we had was tied to CFQ. Again, CFQ uh, is a legacy IO scheduler. It doesn't work in block multi-queue, so we're looking for a solution that worked within the multi-queue framework. Uh, on top of that, uh, the original IO throttling support was done back in the uh, early days of Flash, I'd say, or even before that, so it wasn't very scalable. didn't work very well. So Xiaowa um, added some new support for this that uh, scales much better, functions much better on SSDs. It supports Cgroups v2. Um, it's merged for 4.12 with the caveat that the interface is still um, unstable. Uh, I think the developers of it weren't quite sure if the interface was something that was easy to use for people or hard. So um, after having talked to a bunch of people about this and, and attempting to run it in production, we decided to just merge it with the uh, interface being uh, in flux um, um, so we could see how people would use it and that would help guide how the interface would change. I think I'm running out of time, so I'll, I'll go a little quick. Um, finally, after I did this talk, I actually looked at the old talk I did for 2015 here at Kernel Recipes, and for that I had a uh, final slide that said future work. 
and um, by happy coincidence, basically all the things that were mentioned on that for future work are things that we end up getting done for the IO stack. So that was, <laughs> thank you. So my crystal ball is working. Um, obviously these were the pain points, so it wasn't too much of a crystal ball thing, but still. And uh, since I was so successful, I only put two items on this one because I didn't, didn't want to be on the hook for that next year. Um, but I, two of the things I see coming down the pipeline for the IO stack is one called IO determinism. This is another thing that's coming out of the uh, NVMe side of things on flash devices where uh, people are tired of provisioning their devices with the, um, you know, running them at maybe only half speed to get deterministic latencies out of them. So IO determinism is a way for you to know exactly what sort of read latencies you'll get. It's a way for you to eliminate uh, what we call the noisy neighbor problem when you pack multiple applications on a single drive and you don't want the, the one guy doing writes to be impacting your reads on this side. Um, we're gonna need some kernel support for that, um, so we'll be working on it in, in, uh, in the near future. And finally, uh, continued efficiency improvements. This is enough of a wide umbrella that I can definitely put this on the slide um, because I always find something that'll match for that. Um, but obviously with the uh, pressure of, as I mentioned, SPDK and DPDK, the uh, user land uh, hardware uh, infrastructure, we want to ensure that the kernel is still the fastest and easiest way to do uh, IO in the system. And with that, I'll take any questions. No? Ben? <laughs> That's a good question. Do we still need floppy.c? Well, I think the problem is that the only people that can test it now are using KVM or something like that, right? Don't even actually have hardware. Um, but people, I think, still use it for that. I'm pretty sure that if I removed it, people would scream bloody murder. See, there's a guy right here. <laughs> what? Yeah, we can. Yeah, I mean, if you're fine with it, we can kill it. Yeah, sorry. Can we move swim three, Ben says. They're, so the remaining drivers that we haven't converted are basically just for ancient, ancient crap. So not only is the driver horrible because the hardware is horrible, but nobody has this stuff. So it's, it's very hard with any level of confidence to convert a driver because nobody's able to test it. So at some point, we're just killing these off. But I would much rather uh, we get them converted since killing off is like a multi-year, you know, decade-long process. Um, so if, if we have to wait for that before we can remove the old IO stack, we're never going to get done. Not until, not before I retire at least. Yes? So it's in, so the question is, does, it, does the right back hints or the right lifetime hints work with any NVMe device that support 1.3? I think it's an optional feature. Um, there are devices out there now that do support it. Um, at least we're able to get firmware from these guys that do support it. So, but in the NVMe 1.3 spec is really recent, like within the last couple of months. So it'll probably take a while for this to uh, bubble up into consumer-like devices. Uh, so the question is, where does light NVM fit into all this? Um, I mean, they're still, they're still going on full steam ahead. Um, I haven't been as much involved in light NVM or, or open channel SSDs. Uh, Matias and Javier are generally uh, doing that stuff. Um, but they say that they're seeing a, multiple, a multitude of vendors supporting this. And uh, it's one of those things that are, users are really interested in it. and and. Um, Places like Facebook and other big companies, right, would love, and love nothing more than to have fully commoditized flash where you can just fly these flash cards from any vendor, which is just basically a stick of flash and we do everything in software. That solves a lot of the black box issues that we have. Um, in fact, something like the uh, lifetime hints and the IO determinism is NVMe's answer to, to some of these problems, right, where people say the black box is an issue, we want something open, we can control ourselves. So I think there's still somewhat of a, a power struggle there on um, people that want a classic or pure NVMe and, and adding the features that people need to support it versus the ones that want to run the uh, open channel stuff. All right, that's it. Thank you. <laughs>